Do you know that some of the symptoms of aneurysm, if undetected, may lead to dire consequences such as stroke and brain damage? How can we prevent the risk of arterial ruptures due to aneurysm? Are all aneurysms serious? Today we are honoured to have Dr. Benjamin Chua to shed light on how to present the risks, prevent the risks of aneurysm as well as debunk some myths surrounding this poorly understood condition. Dr. Chua is a renowned vascular and endovascular surgeon and also a regional proctor and expert on life cases and demonstrator for endovascular procedures. He is currently the medical director and Senior Consultant of Vascular Surgery at the Vascular and Intervention Center at Vascular and Intervention Center. Prior to setting up the Vascular and Intervention Center, Dr. Chua was the founding head of the Department of Vascular Surgery at Singapore General Hospital, the first independent clinical department in Singapore dedicated to caring for patients with vascular diseases. He was, he was also a senior consultant, surgeon and director of endovascular surgery. He is currently the adjunct professor of surgery at both the Yong Luden School of Medicine and the Duke NUS Graduate School of Medicine at the National University of Singapore. Amidst his many awards and achievements, his clinical practice, Dr. Chua, Dr. Chua's passion are with arctic aneurysm, limb salvage, vascular and endovascular surgery, and his drive is to, pro is to provide effective treatment for diabetic foot problems to prevent amputation and to treat arteric symptoms early. We have the honour of inviting Dr. Chua to present. Thank you. Thank you for the very kind introduction. But actually, I'm very honoured to be here to share with everyone the work that we do. Um, you know, this is a very co common problem that we see. If you're in a public hospital, on average twice a month, three times a month, you have a patient coming in unconscious. And the reason people always think it's a heart attack, actually they're bleeding inside from an aneurysm rupture, either in the brain or any other part of the body. And it is a serious problem. As a young uh, training surgeon, uh, I got involved in vascular surgery exactly because of that. Um, and I still do a lot of aneurysm surgery. Uh, it is one surgery that is not easy. Uh, it is a lot of excitement because your heart is pumping very fast because the patient is actually bleeding out in front of you and you've got to make very key decisions. But the interesting thing about it is a lot of it is actually preventable. And the sad thing about it is, of course, that we still don't prevent enough to prevent death and we still see cases like that. Which is why, to me, uh, it's a personal mission to talk about this uh, in different parts of the body and I hope today to share and enlighten you on what the problem is and how we can prevent it. And there are some little things we can do and how we can treat it if you have it. So I put this slide up because I'm sure you recognise all these people. So that's Albert Einstein, that's the famous Dr. Michael DeBakey, and that's uh, Lucille Ball. The common thing with all three of them is they all had aneurysms and they died from them. Well, DeBakey didn't really die from him, he died of OH after he nearly died from it, but Albert Einstein had two aneurysm repairs. He had one and he survived another five years and then he ruptured and then he died. And Lucille Ball, of course, died uh, straight from an aneurysm. So what is an aneurysm? It's a very big word. In fact, it doesn't even sound English. <laughs> an aneurysm. Okay, in the Chinese, we call it zu dong mai xue liu. Okay, uh, but basically, it affects arteries and it's an abnormal enlargement of the blood vessels. It can happen anywhere in your blood vessels, anywhere in the artery. But the more common sites, obviously, will be the brain, the chest, the abdomen, and sometimes even in the legs. But the three most common sites will be the brain, the chest, and the abdomen. Why? Because you obviously, that's the most concentration of arteries anywhere else in the body. All right? Now, if you look at it, you can have it anywhere diagrammatically. You can have it, um, sorry, I'm just trying to figure out, ah, yeah, okay. Well, you can see, uh, uh, anywhere that you have an artery, and these are all the sites that we commonly see in aneurysm, and this is specifically in the abdomen where we see a lot of it, all right? Now, what are the dangers of aneurysm? The way to see an aneurysm is because it is a balloon. It will behave like a balloon. So, if you, I always tell the patient this, the patient will ask me, but so I have this balloon, will it rupture? I said, yes, think of it like you're blowing a balloon. And after a certain point, all of us are going to do this, right? The problem is the person blowing the balloon is not me this time, it's your heart that's pumping. And the pressure is high. And as a result, the balloon just gets bigger and bigger and bigger over time. Now, all of us, our arteries in the body have got three layers and muscular layers. 
so they can withstand a lot of pressure. That is why our heart pumps the vessels around and we measure our blood pressure through the stretching of these arteries. But at a certain point in time, the artery will get thinner and bigger and the muscles are not so strong anymore. And that's where it gets bigger and bigger. And as you know, like a balloon, it can rupture. And now if it bursts, obviously, you bleed. But before bursting, sometimes the, the aneurysm is big, it can compress on things around it. So the arteries are always in very different parts of the body. They travel with veins, they travel with nerves, they travel in certain parts of the body. So as it gets bigger, it can compress. So for example, in the brain, if you have a base of skull aneurysm in the artery there, it can compress on the nerve. And sometimes patients present finally with a nerve problem in their face, and then we diagnose an aneurysm. Okay? It can form a clot inside, because in an aneurysm, when you have a ballooning, the flow is not always very good. The blood flows in a very turbulent, very messy manner. And as blood flows in a messy manner, it forms clots inside it. And sometimes these clots can break off from the aneurysm, and then they travel out of the aneurysm to other arteries. So un not uncommon for us to sometimes see brain aneurysms and patients present with repeated strokes or minor strokes, because clots form in them, and then they travel to other parts of the brain, they cause a stroke. Similarly, in the, in the body, in the belly, if you have an aneurysm, sometimes the clots can break and go down the legs. And then when patients discover that they get pain in their legs when they walk, or sometimes in a very acute situation, they get a totally blocked artery, their legs are cold and painful, then we find an aneurysm. So yes, and rarely, but it happens, the aneurysm can get infected. So we have had patients who we monitor for aneurysm because they're small. And then they get an infection in the gut. Usually it's a gallbladder, sometimes they get a little bit of appendicitis. In fact, some of them even get diarrhea. And then next thing you know, they feel a lot of belly pain and we do a scan, the aneurysm has grown very big with a lot of infection and inflammation around it. And then when we test the blood, because it carries blood, it carries bacteria. So you can get infected and that's a bigger problem. So these are some of the dangers, but the most being that if they rupture, a person can die. So I'll start off by talking about brain aneurysms. I think that gets everybody's interest because of recent events in our parliament, in our cabinet, but actually it is very common, and this can strike any one of us, depending on why you have an aneurysm. Some of the aneurysms in the brain are congenital, meaning you are born with them. Some of them are developmental because of risk factors. So again, you can have it ballooning in any part of the brain. Now, the brain is very, very different. It doesn't have the tolerance like the rest of your body, okay? You can't torture the brain. The brain doesn't take a lot of stress, okay? It works only on pure glucose. That's how your brain works, and it's very fragile. Remember that, and you understand when I say that, okay? So an aneurysm is a localized point of dilatation. And there are many different kinds and shapes and sizes, as you can see. Okay, we, we, we use medical terms, amorphic, berry, secular, side wall, white neck, short neck, and a bifurcation, you name it, we have called it. The problem is because generally you have so many names because people can't agree. Okay, it's like many ways of skinning a cat. But these are terms to describe and there are many variations to it. All right? About one to two percent of the population out here. In other words, if they say we have a hundred people in this room, one to two of us, may have an intracranial aneurysm or inside the head without knowing, okay? And in fact, in this one to two percent, two to three of them will have more than one aneurysm inside the brain. And the peak age of rupture is about 50 to 60 years old. If you look at all the fantastic reports of celebrities, ministers, whoever has a rupture aneurysm, the age group is about there. Sometimes younger, but frequently about this age group. Why? We don't know. Maybe it's because the time taken to grow to a size to rupture, why? Because of pressure. Why? Because of stress. We don't know, but it can. But what are some of the risk factors? Clearly, if you have a family history. So we encourage people who have a family history, if you know for a fact that your father, mother, brother, sister, first degree relatives have had an aneurysm, treated, detected, bleeding from stroke, please come for screening, okay? Especially at the same age. So if they were found to have one at about 50 to 60, you should think about having a screen. And the screening will tell you about it, okay? Smoking. Now, smoking is one of the baddest things you can do to yourself. And not because I say this because you're a doctor, but because I say this, I say this not because it's a doctor, but I say this because it's a doctor seeing the consequences of it every day. Okay? The problem with smoking is there are about 200 different chemicals in cigarettes. And for reasons that are not known to us, we postulate a lot of things, these chemicals weaken the walls of your arteries. They just do. Okay? And we think. Your arteries, remember I tell you, it's a muscular layer, right? <clears throat> so the idea is that the, the smoking causes the elastic layer to wear down and break down. So think of it like a rubber band. You've got a taut rubber band, 
Smoking just causes it to become a loose rubber band over time. Okay? Smoking is bad. And not to mention, of course, you've got problems with cancer, which is a whole different conversation altogether. Okay? High blood pressure. Okay? Again, I told you, like a balloon. Now imagine you keep pumping that balloon at high pressure. So control the blood pressure. Okay? And those as born with weakening of the arteries congenitally. Some people are born with the connective tissue in their body. That means the tissue that makes up the arteries, the walls of the arteries being very poor genetically. So as a result, they are prone to these. And these are the younger patients that we see. Okay? These are the ones who in their 20s or 30s who develop bleeding from aneurysms in different parts of the body. We've got fancy names for them, but I will not go into them. Now, where can you get them in the brain? Now, this is a simplified chart to show you the brain circulation. Okay? Essentially, this part, the front of the brain, the left and the right side, are communicating with each other through smaller arteries called the communicating arteries, the anterior and posterior communicating. The front of the brain is responsible for you talking, for you understanding, for you remembering, for your left hand, your right hand movements and your walking. The back of the brain or the posterior circulation is responsible for balance and for very basic functions at the base of the brain such as breathing. Okay, very functional things, your heart rate. Okay, so if you have a bleed at the back and it's massive, that's why people die, they stop breathing because of pressure. If you have a bleed in this part of the brain here, depending on whether you're left hand or right hand. Now, remember this, your right side of your brain controls your left side of the body. Your left side of the brain controls your right side of the body. So if you have dependent, which side of your body you can get paralysis. One side of you is dominant in certain things. So if you are right-handed, then only your left side dominant for motor, okay? And cognition is more right side. I mean speech and all mostly come right side. That's why you see some people, when they get affected, depending on which part, depends on which part of the brain now. The brain can be mapped out different parts. One part of the brain here is for vision, one part here is for speech. Depending on which part is affected, it affects you in a stroke. Depending on which artery bleeds, that's where you get the symptoms, right? So you understand now. Now, also understand, your skull in the brain is a confined space. All you have is bone and your skull. Okay, and your skull is 360 around at the base also, it's a skull, right? So when you bleed, the brain swells. And when it swells, <coughs> there's nowhere for it to expand. And as a result, you get a lot of pressure on the brain. And that's why people die from massive bleeding strokes because it's pressure on the back of the brain, it's pressure on the whole brain. And you stop breathing, your heart stops beating. So this is the reason why when you have an aneurysm, you can die from it. I have to put it very simply, okay? So how do aneurysms present clinically? How do we spot a patient? Well, the bad news is the vast majority are asymptomatic. No symptoms until the first bleed happens or the first trouble occurs, okay? And the first presentation is usually a bleed in the brain or subarachnoid bleed. Um, and then a large number are detected Incidentally, we do see a large number of patients who go for screening for other things. Sometimes they get a brain scan because they're giddy. Sometimes they get a brain scan because they have a headache, and then we pick up an aneurysm. Headache may or may not be related, but it is there. Okay? Occasionally, as I said, you can have some neurological deficits. Not common, especially if it's key parts that are near the nerves, then you can pick it up. But it takes a sharp clinician to sort of pick it up. And again, what happens when aneurysm ruptures? 15% die before they reach the hospital. This is based on data. Overall, 50% mortality in the first 30 days. That means half the patients will survive, half will not, if they have a massive bleed. Okay? And of those survive, half will have a major disability. That means a stroke has occurred, the brain has been damaged, then the focus is no more on treating the aneurysms or preventing it, but on rehabilitation. And of those that have appropriate treatment, in time, about two-thirds will never get the same quality of life if there's a focal neurological deficit, mm -hmm. all right? Now, then the question is, what is the risk if you find an aneurysm? How do you know a rupture? It is all based on size, okay? In pending, and we go by millimeters. Can you imagine, and this is millimeters, not even a centimeter, a millimeter. And you can see, if you have a 2.5 cm or 25 millimeter aneurysm, the risk of it rupturing uh, in five years, cumulative is at, at least 50%, depending on where it is. Okay, so it's important to detect it. Because once it's happened, you can't go back into it, all right? In Singapore, the size of our ruptured aneurysms, we look at the data, it's about four to five millimeters in size. So very small, huh? This peanut size thing can cause so much damage, okay? Now, how do we diagnose? I think a CT scan is good. 
CT scan is good in acute situation. That means if there are symptoms or the bleed has occurred and you want to try and find an aneurysm. This is the most common presentation, by the way. Patient comes with a bleeding stroke, we scan to find an aneurysm straight away. And we try and treat it before it reforms again. Okay? And in that sort of situation, you take away the bleeding first in the brain to decompress the brain, then you deal with the aneurysm to prevent her re-bleeding. Bleeding. All right? So this is a typical example. The CT scan looks exactly like that. You can see a spot of bleeding, but if you look carefully, this is the spot of the aneurysm here. Okay? This is the bleeding that is looked at in the initial phase. All right? So what are treatment options when you find an aneurysm? The old school treating treatment for many, many years has been surgical clipping. Uh, I don't have a video, but surgical clipping involves opening up the skull and going through the brain material to where the aneurysm is and then putting a clip on it to block it off. It sounds all great, except for the fact that to get to the aneurysm, you have to go through brain. And remember, I told you brain is very sensitive. So the process itself can sometimes cause a lot of damage, but sometimes you don't have a choice. Okay? So nowadays, even as surgeons, we try not to go all the way in with a clip, do do clipping unless the aneurysm is easily accessible with little ability or little damage to the brain tissue. Most people now like us, we treat, we treat without opening the brain and it's called endovascular treatment. And a treatment is coiling and we use special stents called flow divide, the, uh, diverters. So coiling is a very interesting thing. What happens is that you try and put coils, coils, metal coils literally, inside the aneurysm, form the arteries in the leg. You head up to the brain and you find the aneurysm under x-ray guidance, and then you pack it full of coils. Because once you pack it full of coils, it will block off. And once it blocks off, it doesn't have the risk to bleed anymore. Okay? And this is likely to increase because less and less people think that clipping is the ideal choice. And for unruptured aneurysms, it is in fact ideal. So this is exactly what it is. We come from the leg, as you can see, and we, under x-ray guidance, we follow the wires up, and we manipulate the wires up right into the brain, from the leg arteries, from the groin. And from there, we look at the aneurysm, we shoot some contrast, which is dye, to show us where it is. Help us get, get there. And then we get there, and then once we're there, we start packing it with coils very slowly, okay? This is a very delicate procedure. If you do it wrongly, you can rupture the aneurysm, and you have a death on table sometimes. So it must be very skilled and done very carefully, okay? So the difference, one is primary coiling, some we use balloons to help us, sometimes we use stents to help us, and sometimes we put special stents. So I'll give you an example. This is a, an aneurysm case where you can see, this is what I mean by an x-ray in the skull, okay? And we use, again, like this. This is a patient, as you can see, this is the big aneurysm here. You can see this ballooning and out pouching, okay? And after we get up there, we stick it full of coils. This is what it looks like. And in the complete job, sorry, in the complete job, we can see that the aneurysm is taken out. It's blocked full of coils, it won't bleed, but the rest of the brain circulation is still going, and there should be very minimal side effects for the patient. The beauty of this sort of procedures is that you can do it from different parts of the brain, and the risk is much lower than imagine opening up the brain and going straight in to clip the aneurysm, okay? But it must be done well. Similarly, same thing here, you have an aneurysm here, and here what we've done is putting coils and putting a stent to support it, like this, and so that everything stays open and is protected. In elective cases, that means patients who have not had a stroke, patients who are picked up incidentally, we can do this procedure, the patient goes home the next day or the day after. There's no major need to stay in a the hospital, they just stay one night for monitoring very closely, okay? But you can understand why we want to do it because once you bleed, this is what happens. Nowadays, we even get better technology. We have something called flow diverting stand where we don't even have to use coils. These are special stands that you can put across the aneurysm. And what it does is it changes the flow inside the aneurysm to cause it to block off, okay? These are called flow diverters, okay? And the beauty of it is that you can put it across an aneurysm but still preserve blood flow to key arteries that come off the aneurysm. In the brain, this is extremely vital because every single artery, if you block it off, any artery, no matter how small, you have an effect on the brain. So sometimes the aneurysm forms and then you have an artery feeding off the aneurysm. You block it, you also block off the artery. With these special stents now, the aneurysm will block off over time, but the artery will still flow. So these are very good. So an example will be a gentleman like this. He has one in the eye artery. 
okay, the artery that goes to the eye. Now, if you call it, he gets blind. Okay, so we put a stand across, um, as you can see. I'm just trying to show you where the stand is in a better view. And after you put it across the artery, it sits very, very nicely. Okay, and he works very well. Similarly, for this case, and the aneurysm is there, it's the arrow points, and you can see the artery sitting, uh, the stent sitting across here, and it preserves flow in the rest of the brain. So this is fairly good technology, and it helps a lot. So this is what I have to say about brain aneurysms. If you pick them up, pick, if you have any family history, if you are risk factors, you think get screened. And the screen is very simple. It is either an MRI or a CT scan of the brain, uh, especially with contrast to look at the blood vessel flow. And then we look at treatment, and the treatment basically is nowadays all through what we call endovascular techniques. You know, it's poking an artery in the groin, and we go up to the brain and we put a call in it. I think this helps a lot for these patients to prevent uh, major strokes. As you know, once a stroke occurs, it's, a, it's actually a battle loss already because you can't do anything about it. You just have to focus on rehabilitation. Some people recover well, some don't. I'm going to move on to another topic of aneurysms, and this is a broader one, and this is called aortic aneurysm. I think I showed this picture. Now, the aorta is the largest artery in the body. It carries blood from the heart. First, it makes all the way in the chest, and three key vessels come off it. Two go right to the brain. Okay? These are the carotid arteries, and branches of it go to the back of the brain as well. Okay? And then one goes to the left arm. Okay? Don't ask me why it's so special. We are made that way. Okay? But the one to the left arm also provides some supply to the back of the brain. So these are the key arteries that come off the aorta first, in the chest, in the neck. And then as it comes down, it gives off branches to the spinal cord, as well as to the kidney arteries, to the intestine, to the liver, to the stomach, and then down to the pelvis where it splits to supply first your pelvic organs and then your legs. Okay? So aorta is the biggest organ, literally, in terms of blood flow in the body. And you can get an aneurysm anywhere in the aorta, okay? from where it comes off the heart, from where it gives off blood supply to the brain, from where in the chest, and all the way down uh, to the belly. Now, this is common in our population in the sense that 3% of men, or 3% of the population have an aortic aneurysm undetected, okay? And this is what it looks like up close at surgery, okay? A huge, huge ballooning. This is what we see when we do the operations, the major operations to fix it, okay? Now, risk factors for developing an aortic aneurysm, 3 to 4%, more than 60 years of age, have an aortic aneurysm. It's a male predominance. Uh, now you know why all the sensors show that men live shorter than women. <laughs> it's natural selection in our favor, obviously. Uh, chronic smoking, it is a very, very big problem, chronic smoking. High blood pressure, and if you have a family history of atherosclerosis or heart disease, okay, the same disease that affects the heart vessels can affect the aorta. The difference in the heart vessel is it blocks off and you get a heart attack. The difference in the aorta is it gets big and it ruptures. Okay? Family history is also important. I've got patients who are family. Uh, I've treated um, father, brother, and daughter, all with aneurysms, all in the same spot, all got treated. <laughs> Because I treat one, then the other two panic, and they went to scan, and then they found. You know, it is clustering, okay? Especially, interestingly, in women. The French have shown clusters in large groups of women relatives. Don't know why, okay? But overall, if you have a strong family history, in the first degree, you should get screened, like the brain aneurysm as well. And if you have a family history of what we call connective tissue disorders or disease, okay? Again, large majority have no symptoms. They're picked up incidentally. I get always referred patients or called to see patients who have gone for a CT scan for what they think is a kidney stone, for what they think is a colotic problem. Okay? Sometimes patients get severe abdominal or back pain. And the back pain is not the kind of back pain that you get from activity, from overstraining, from playing tennis, but pain that's persistent and does not go away. No matter what you do, okay, it is there. It's aching. It's n Some patients describe it as nagging pain. And it's usually it's a back, sometimes it's in the tummy. And you sit forward, you lean back. That's it for aneurysms in the tummy. And for those in the chest, it's chest pain. Often mistaken for a heart attack. But then we pick them up on screening for a heart attack. Okay? Some patients get leg cramps because the clots form and the aneurysms go down the legs and block the leg arteries. So when they walk, they can't get enough oxygen 
the muscles start cramping up. Okay? And some people, because the aneurysms affect the kidney function, uh, affect the region where the kidney arteries take off, the kidney functions are no good. Then suddenly they see a rise in the kidney function, uh, blood tests <coughs> on, on testing. Okay? But mostly, again, no signs. But why are we so aggressive with these aortic aneurysms? And this just tells you everything. Okay? Basically, it tells you that the bigger it is, the higher the risk of rupture, if you look at it in terms of centimetre. So you have something more than 8 cm, it is 30 to 50% per year, cumulative. In other words, in two years, it is 60 to 100% rupture if you have a big 8 cm wide aneurysm. If you have a less than 4 cm, the risk of rupture every year is zero. If somewhere in between, you have between 0.5 to 40%. Okay? Then when you add in other risk factors, like high blood pressure, smoking and all that, things get more complex. Now, to, to be fair, I have not seen an aneurysm patient, or rather, I shouldn't say that, maybe about 9 out of 10 of the aneurysm patients I've seen, invariably, so they'll have a history of smoking, have a history of high blood pressure, have a history of one of these diseases. I've rarely had one patient who per turned out with an aneurysm and no risk factors. Okay? It doesn't happen that way. It's usually something that pushes it towards the edge. Again, surgery is fixing it traditionally and it's very messy. Okay? I skip through pictures because I see some people whinging. But we do the surgery all the time. And I can tell you, it is one of the surgeries that keeps you up in the middle of the night. And this was a story told to me uh, <clears throat> by someone recently. He said, hey, you know, he's now an upper GI surgeon, a stomach surgeon. He said, you know, I want to do vascular surgery. Then I met my boss at the time he was 60 years old. He said, I know why you want to do vascular surgery, because it's exciting to do aortic surgery. But that's because you are 35 years old. When you're 60 years old, you hate it because it gets too much of your heart pumping and you can get a heart attack. It is true. It is very stressful. It's very fast-acting surgery because you will decide whether the patient lives or not in your surgery. And that's what keeps a lot of us into vascular surgery. But as you get older, you find a better way of doing it. Okay? And I'll be honest and tell you, I have not done open surgical repair for an aneurysm. Maybe I've done two cases in the last year. Okay? Because now, which is what I'm going to share with you, we again have newer and better technology. So there always has to be a better thing. Because surgery comes with a certain morbidity. Patients get a lot of side effects from open opera operations. So I was not the first guy to think about that. <clears throat> in 1991, this, uh, um, I guess it's Argentinian, surgeon called Dr. Parodi decided, why don't we do it better? Instead of keeping, having to open a patient up, control bleeding and all the problems with that, like opening the brain up, let's fix it better. And he thought, why don't we design a stent? And the stent can be put inside the aneurysm without opening a patient up. Much like the coils, okay? His first patient was actually his dog. In those days, you can do anything you want. So he took his first patient, a dog, and he created an aneurysm on a dog, and he stitched a graft together, and he put it on a balloon, he turned on an x-ray, and he shoved it in a dog, and the dog survived. So he said, patient number one, my dog survived. So patient number two, he actually found a patient. If you do this nowadays, I think it's criminal. Huh? But in those days, you could. Okay? And we're thankful that he did. He, every vascular meeting, major meeting, he turns out he's venerated all of us because he has changed the way we fix it. And the way we fix it now is no more op open operations. We now use stents. Okay, and these are different. These are stents that are covered. And the idea is you line the inside of the aneurysm with the stent so that it doesn't expand anymore. Okay? And you divert the flow through a tube, and this tube will stay in the patient forever. Okay? And how it looks like is this is a lady with a big aneurysm, as you can see. This bit here is the aneurysm sitting nicely. Okay? And we put the stents in through the groin under x-ray. And once you put it in, it is gone. So, large studies have been published and done to show that this is probably a very good way of doing it. And we do it in a special operating theatre with very good monitoring, anesthesia and x-ray. That's all we need. Okay? When we have a team that does it, usually. And in fact, nowadays, we don't even need major anesthesia because we don't even make any cuts. We just all make small punctures in the artery. How many here have gone for a coronary angiogram? Somebody. Anybody has gone for a check on the heart where they puncture the artery? Nobody? Or oh, a very healthy crowd. <laughs> Normally when I ask this question, a few hands will come up. Or you may be shy. Okay? But it's the same way. Okay? If you are familiar with the procedure, basically we give numbing medicine in the groin. And then under x-ray and ultrasound, we just make a puncture. And then we make a gap in your skin and your artery 
about two to three millimeters. Okay? And the device goes up under X-ray and we do it. And this is exactly what we are doing in the theater with the X-ray guidance. Okay? And it is a very, very good procedure. Um, and we do it, in fact, why we want to do it this way, we can do it for patients who are high risk. Remember, this disease affects patients who are older, most times. Okay? But in the old days when doctors were ages, the almost refrain was, Aya, you're 80 years old, Aya, don't fix it. Lah. You know, wait for it to rupture and then go peacefully. Lah. You know, that, was my, that was my mother's time, they used to say that. Nowadays, I had a conversation with you and I said, Sir, how's your quality of life? Oh, I still play mahjong. I still play golf. Okay? I like to meet friends. Sure, I got heart disease, I got diabetes, I got this. But I look at you and I say, you're talking to me now, right? And with this procedure, the risk is so low, we can enable patients to continue that. It doesn't mean you have to wait to die. Okay? So this is the way we do it. And the way we do it is because it is low risk now, because we do it a lot under sedation. You don't even need general anesthesia. So we give a little bit of sedation, make you sleepy, we numb the area, and this process goes on. In straightforward cases, we take about an hour, hour and a half and then you're back in a ward, and usually you're home in two to three days. Now, if we had done a traditional operation, you'll be in ICU for one week, because you'll be open up, you'll have a lot of problems, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of recovery, there's chest infection, breathing is a problem, you know, and, but you need general anesthesia, and some patients, the heart is too weak. You, the risk of anesthesia itself is significant. So that's why we developed this way of doing it, which is what we call percutaneous. In other words, we use a device that can close the puncture hole, and you just make a puncture, and you close it, and then the aneurysm goes up. And the stand goes up, and we block off the aneurysm. So this method is also very good because nowadays, aneurysms are also getting very, very complex. Uh, I, I used to joke and say that the simple aneurysms we don't do nowadays because everybody has fixed them already. You know, the difficult ones are left behind, nobody wants to do, so then we get to fix them. So we have different techniques now to deal with more and more difficult aneurysms. This is to show you a patient who had a difficult aneurysm repair. Do you realize he has got very little scars? Just some minor bruises, okay? These are the two scars he has, one here, one here, one on the arm, and one in the neck here, okay? This is a difficult aneurysm that traditionally we have required an opening of the chest and the abdomen as well. And this is the patient after the surgery, straight after two small puncture holes, and this is him in a ward six hours later. This is an 85-year-old man having his meal and asking when can I go home, okay? So the technology is not, nothing fancy, it's just that the technology has evolved so much now. Okay, that the devices are so much better, we have so much better x-ray machines, and uh, we can do things so efficiently with very good anesthesia that patients recover faster. I will not bore you with these very complex pictures, but the long and short of it is you can do a lot of things with these patients. Okay, especially this, because remember, this is a condition if untreated, if rupture is almost certain mortality in certain places. In Singapore now, the quoted number, if it ruptures and you get to hospital, Number one, if it ruptures, half the patients die from the patient on the spot. On those who get to the hospital and we have to do an emergency surgery, six out of ten will not survive. Only four will have a good fighting chance. This is an emergency situation where rupture. Because once the rupture occurs, bleeding occurs, your whole body physiology, the whole body goes haywire. We can do the most perfect operation, but we can't control things like blood not clotting properly, body not warming up, liver going to failure, gut going to failure. You know, things like that, okay? So, sometimes it's not easy. So, the idea is you have to fix them very, very early, okay? So, the paradigm has shifted. Aneurysms now can be treated in any part of the body using new approaches. We don't necessarily... There's, in the past, people used to say, if you have aneurysm in the brain somewhere, nothing you can do, just wait for it to rupture, make your will. Okay, in the belly, if you're a certain age, they say the same thing. No more. Okay, because the technology is so good and we've been trying to get this message not out to not only people, patients we find very effective because they ask for the treatment, but also our fellow physicians. You'll be amazing. You'll be amazed to hear some of our fellow physicians speaking that way still. That, hey, this one, don't fix, just wait, you know. But patients should always be offered the choice, okay, and we need to talk to them to understand. And with better technology and skill sets, of course, we can be treating these aneurysms with much less morbidity and mortality. Of course, we need to be familiar with what we're doing. This is why we all go for training and we go overseas a lot for conferences. We uh, train other people, people train us. We have a community that develops this process and gets better with the technology. And then you need good planning. And I think that way we can treat many of the aneurysms we see because to me, this is a big problem. It has to be treated before it becomes fatal. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Chua. I would like to ask if anyone has any questions. Our roving mics are around again, and anyone who would like to ask any questions? Yeah. Uh, the gentleman there. Okay, just a moment. Hi, um, I'd like to yeah. know if um, migraine has anything to do with aneurysm, uh, with a family history of aneurysm, hemorrhage, death and stroke. Thank you. That's actually, that's actually a very good question. We get asked this a lot and I see a lot of patients with that problem. Um, now, the question is, in reverse I ask you, do you are you sure your migraine is a migraine? Okay? Right. So everybody giggles or laughs at the question or gives me a blank look. The point is, if it's a persistent headache that keeps coming and you have a family of aneurysm, you should be screened for an aneurysm. Okay? And the reason why you get headaches in an aneurysm is because it has a pressure effect on the brain tissue. Think of it as your brain saying, hey, something is wrong. I'm having this thing here, it's wrong. Now, the migraine is very classical in that you have temporal headaches, you get a trigger, sometimes it's stress, sometimes it's light. For women, frequently, it's when you're, um, it's close to menstruation, you get migraine, okay? Um, but it is incumbent on a physician who diagnoses migraine, especially in a history of background of aneurysms, that they must exclude that. And it doesn't mean that because you're young, you say that this is migraine. It can happen to anyone, especially a family history. So you should get yourself screened for aneurysm. And the easiest way is to do either a CT angiogram or an MRI. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, yes, doctor. Uh, can the aneurysm be cured? I, well, this whole talk was showing you that it's cured. Can cure, Essentially, it, it can but be cured. I, I have an aneurysm uh, more than 10 years ago. Sure. But I still find all needles on my face and neck sometimes. You, uh, you had a brain aneurysm, yes. can I say? How did, you, how did they find and, out? Uh, I was diagnosed with uh, migraine for only for one month. There you go. That was the answer to you yeah. <laughs> earlier. Uh, after but the migraine, then I started to have that. Then I cannot even get up. Even sure. I go, I cannot get up. So they say you better go hospital. So uh, Dr. Prime Premium uh, scanned for me. They, yes. At first they said I have a tumour. Uh, mm. So I was very frightened tumour. Then after that, uh, there are some doctors from other countries found out that it's not a tumour, it's a aneurysm. Okay, so, so let me take it that, I assume you said 10 years ago. I think up until 10 years ago, we didn't really understand it a lot and technology was still not there and people were not very trained, still different. I mean, things have evolved, like how we have a better quality of living in Singapore from 1965 until now. So clearly, imaging is better now and I think if... Uh, I still have some need sometimes. So, uh, on medication or any bio? Sorry? Bio. Neurobio. Neurobion. Okay. Uh, is that the only medicine? It depends on where your aneurysm is. I was, I, I'll come to that in a bit. But the point I was trying to make is that um, nowadays with better imaging, certainly we can detect it better. Okay? Uh, Singapore, we are all very fortunate to have a very good medical system. I see a lot of patients from Indonesia who are misdiagnosed or from surrounding countries. Okay, we are fortunate in that we have a good government, we have a good training system, our doctors are generally very credible. Lah. Okay, once in a while you see a few of us getting slapped in the newspapers for misbehaving, but that's a separate story. Okay? But the point is, I speak the truth. Okay? So things are going to get better diagnosed. We have access to a very good technology now. Exactly. So, depends on the way you treat now. In response to your question, why your symptoms, it depends on when it was picked up. If you're asymptomatic, generally after treatment, you should remain asymptomatic if, it's, if we treat it well and there are no complications. Sometimes surgery to get to the, anus, to the aneurysm, if you have to clip it, may affect certain things along the way. As I said, surgery to clip it means you've got to separate the normal brain, get to the artery, put a clip on it. And in that process can sometimes cause some minor effects. I'm sure your doctors will have told you, if we clip it, these are the side effects, da 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 Okay? But as I was saying, with latest coiling now, a lot of times you don't have that. Sometimes you do get a little bit of swelling around. The aneurysm after we call it, like inflammation, and you get some side effects, but it get better. That's interesting. Have you been screened?
Yeah. You're talking about after surgery, right? Yeah. Now still, huh? We should take a look at you and see what the problem is because sometimes you have to make sure. Have you, are you on follow up still? Sure. Yeah. Well, maybe in the interest of your. Understand. So, in the interest of your privacy, I won't discuss it with you now. I'll talk to you offline after this. But the whole point I'm trying to make is rightly get detected early, get treated well, you'll be fine. Okay? Uh, Yes. Uh, pork lover, uh, if they eat pork frequently, we we'll call this problem. Because pork a lot of fat and take a uh, longer time to digest. And second question, did Bill Slee die from this disease? Uh, Bill Slee. Sorry? Bill Slee. Second question, did Bill Slee die from this disease? I thought Bill Slee had a heart attack, but I'm not no, sure. No, uh, reads someone is someone burst in his brain or so. Thank you. Yeah. A lot of um, a lot of people have had this problem, uh, and have. Uh, uh, had this problem um, but back to your point it's not so much pork but yes a diet high in fat uh, and I, I would be the first to admit I'm the last person to talk about diet and fat <laughs> um, for those who <laughs> yeah, clearly but the point is yes it does raise your cholesterol and cholesterol is one of high cholesterol is one of the risk factors uh, that can cause narrowing of the arteries or weakening of the arteries so yes indirectly yes eating pork. But having said that, of all meats, the worst one you can eat in terms of fat and uh, uh, cholesterol is actually beef. Uh, white meat is generally safer like chicken and pork. Okay? And more protein. I don't mean bakut teh kind of pork. La, proper pork. La. Okay? Um, I'm not aware of Bruce Lee, but there's, there have been famous people. That have, actually, it doesn't matter whether you're famous. You're only famous by name, right? What's important is whether you have it. Yeah. No. But he, there are people who have been fit and they get aneurysm because congenitally they have a history of it. We d still do not understand why some people get it, why some don't. It's like a luck of the draw. We don't understand why they're family clusters. People always look for a gene. But if you find a gene, then you have to show what the gene is responsible. And that's always the problem. Okay? The fact is, if you have symptoms and you have a high risk factor, we know for a fact that if you have family history and you have risk factors, then get screened because your chances are higher. That's why we say get screened. Right? But it also doesn't mean that if you're really fit and healthy and otherwise, sure, you want to get screened, you can. Lah. Chances of finding also a bit low. Lah. Okay? But it's no harm. Yeah? Do we have any other questions? Uh, excuse me. A person uh, at 48 having an aortic uh, dissection. Yes. And... Um, Open heart surgery with a stent. Yes. Survived. Yes. Uh, any chances of having it in future having a rupture? And how long will the stent last? Good question. Now, what, obviously you're speaking from personal experience or some family. Aortic dissection is a bit different than an aneurysm. I didn't talk about it because it is a little bit more complex. Um, uh, but it can happen. And aortic dissection means, now remember I told you the artery has got three layers. Yeah. Now. Sometimes the innermost layer, the one that lines with your blood in contact, can tear. And it can tear into the middle layer as well. And blood flows between the first and second or the second and third layers. Okay? And what happens is the innermost layer then gets shifted and becomes very small. And then blood flows into what we call a false lumen or a false layer. The problem with that is sometimes it affects blood flow to your other organs. Okay, so depending, sometimes it can tear and affect blood flow. The blood flow and the narrowing of the true blood supply can affect the flow to the kidneys or the intestines and it becomes a problem where your intestines don't get enough blood flow, you can die from that. Or your kidneys go into failure. Sometimes it can flow backwards and flow into the heart valves and the heart arteries and you get a heart attack. Sometimes it can tear and flow, affect flow up to your brain, you get a stroke. Okay? But also understand that once this occurs, the artery is very weak. And in future, an aneurysm may develop that can then rupture. Okay? So it is traditionally quoted that if you have a dissection, it depends on what symptoms and how urgent we sometimes fix it. Because it is known, if you look at a large cohort of patients, that if you leave a dissection alone and it's big enough, you don't fix it, and the blood pressure is not controlled, within six months, about half of these people will develop a big aneurysm that can rupture. Okay? So a dissection is a whole different kettle of fish. Fortunately, we don't see that many. But risk factors for dissection, 
Hypertension is the number one cause. Uncontrolled blood pressure. Invariably, when a patient comes in a dissection, they have really sky-high BP. Some people say it's because of the pain of the dissection causing the BP. Some people say it's the, di the high blood pressure causing the dissection and then causes the pain to cause a high BP. Whatever it is, high blood pressure is a big factor. Smoking, anything that can be the same, same risk factor, same group. Okay? Response to your question, surgery done, stenting done, can you get another aneurysm? Yes, you can. Okay, it depends on how extensive the surgery was. Sometimes people don't cover the whole dissection because it's impossible. Sometimes we do part surgery first and stage it. Sometimes we cover all, but the further part gets aneurysmal. Because you brought a very important point. We do not, in the past, we used to see the aorta as a singular organ with one disease process. So it's a bit like a thyroid, you get a lump. Oh, a lump in a thyroid. That's it, take your thyroid, throw. Okay? You get something else, you see what you take. You know surgeons, right? We only know how to take everything out, right? <laughs> Give a surgeon a knife, he's the happiest guy in the world. Okay? But the point is, now we are beginning to recognize that aortic aneurysms and dissections are a dynamic process. In other words, after I fix an aneurysm here, patient never, never leaves my care. I follow them for the rest of their lives because they can get aneurysms or dissections in anywhere else of the body. It is a continuous dynamic process because they are blood vessels and they can be affected by changes in pressure everywhere. I hope that explains that to you. Are there uh, any more questions? I want to find out. Uh, okay. Is bleeding from the brain largely due to an, an aneurysm? Sorry, bleeding from brain. Bleeding from the brain. Yeah. So, I take one step back. You're asking me what are the causes of a stroke, if you want to say it that way. There are two causes. One is blocked artery. That's ischemic stroke. That's far more common than the other one, which is a bleeding stroke. And if you have bleeding in the brain, you always have to look for a cause. And invariably underlying it, possibly, is an aneurysm. There are people who have non-aneurysmal bleeds, and these are due to blood pressure changes. And these are usually in the very, very small vessels, okay, what we call lacuna bleeds. Okay? They are not as dramatic as an aneurysm, but they can also cause stroke. We could take a question. Any other questions? Sorry, the reason why we have to look for the Sorry. bleeding and aneurysm, if we think there's bleed, uh, the reason we have to look for an aneurysm in the case of a bleeding stroke is because if you don't treat it, they can bleed again. Mm -hmm. So the first time they bleed, you have a problem. Second time they bleed, patient can die. Yeah? So must always look for it. What about is a something like motor neuron? That's different. Thing. So motor neuron disease is degeneration of the brain. Nothing to do, well, not so much to do with blood bleeding or not getting enough blood supply. It is wasting of the brain cells. Uh, and there are different conditions that are affected. Some people think it may be related to blood supply. Uh, some people think now that you can have um, dementia related to blood supply invariably. That's the conclusion that if you have diabetes, effects of blood flow over time, you can develop some features of dementia because the brain tissue is slowly dying from poor blood supply. Okay, but that's a different thing altogether. Okay, thank you. We'll take, uh, okay. an, we'll take one question, one last um, question. Numbness in the limbs, uh, the legs and the hands, mm -hmm. uh, is that a factor or a symptom? Sure. So in medicine, I was taught the number one rule is never, nothing is 100%. <laughs> I never ever say this is guaranteed pao chiao. And never. <laughs> okay? So in response to your question, yes, it can be, but it's rare. Okay? If you have numbness, what we normally do in your neck and hands, depending on where it is. Now, numbness is a sign of usually nerves. Okay? Nerves is a big thing okay? in some form or another. When you tell me you have numbness alone, but your hands and legs are warm and you're walking without pain, it usually is a problem with the nerves. Now, if you know your hand nerves come from the neck and come down here, the ones in your leg come from your back. These are also the places where you place a lot of stress on your spine. Uh, all of us read our iPad and phone. All of us write a lot, do a lot of work. Or you sit and you bend, you take part in sports, that sort of thing, carry heavy loads. This puts a strain on your spine. And then when you put a strain on your spine, two things can happen. You know the soft jelly layer between your spinal, the shock absorbers, they can start pushing outwards and press on a nerve. That gives you acute pain and numbness of your limbs. That means suddenly it's like a slip disc. But over time, if you keep stressing it, what happens? Your bone gets very smart. Your body gets smart. The spine says, look, this is very stressful. I need more bone. Okay? I need to form more bone 
over it. The problem is it's irregular bone formation, okay, and it presses on your nerves. That's called osteoarthritis, okay, and that is why sometimes you can press on your nerves and cause numbness. Having said that, we usually evaluate and make sure that this is the cause of it. If this is not the cause of it and we can't seem to find any other cause that's associated with nerves, then we go to the brain as well. Because yes, it is rare, but you can have problems in there that can cause sensations of numbness or feeling of weakness. But it is extremely rare. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chua. But We'd like to present you with the token of our appreciation. Thank you.